Political and Civil Liberties and Comparative Law. She is a graduate of Hebrew University in Jerusalem and Yale Law School. She held a Rockefeller Fellowship and a Fellowship at the Center for the Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University in California. Professor Lahav is the author of the acclaimed biography, Judgment in Jerusalem, Chief Justice Simon Argonaut and the Zionist Century, and with others, The History of Law in a Multicultural Society. And her title today is Gender Neutral Praying, Religion and State. Thank you very much. to join everyone else in thanking um, Anne Browdy and Hannah Herzog for uh, this wonderful conference, which is uh, so intellectually stimulating and make me both think and feel um, the issue of uh, gender, religion, and politics. Um, um, uh, first, I, let me start with uh, a few basic facts about um, uh, Islam and Judaism, which are the two, these are two uh, uh, religions which I'm uh, comparing. I'm also planning to add uh, Catholicism to it, but this is uh, down the road uh, in the future. Uh, it, uh, so first, uh, traditional Islam. Uh, women are required and encouraged to pray under Islam. Women are not encouraged to pray in the mosque and they are not allowed to lead a prayer, nor are they allowed to deliver the kutbah, which is the sermon in the uh, Friday afternoon uh, prayers. Um, uh, in the progressive Islam, in contradistinction to uh, traditional Islam, uh, progressive Islam is a very small movement, particularly active in the United States, and what you see there is uh, an emphasis on uh, women-friendly mosques, so that uh, it's, uh, uh, there is an emphasis on making sure that women have their own space in the mosque to pray, that the, the space is clean, that the space is accessible, and so on and so forth. There is also a movement uh, of uh, acquiring knowledge, um, giving women access to knowledge uh, in the, into the religious sources, and also um, a, a developing... Um, um, uh, corpus of uh, studies of the sources uh, that prohibit or inhibit women's participation in public prayer and efforts to assess the validity of these sources under the Quran and to uh, suggest uh, ways of um, uh, uh, improving the situation concerning uh, women. Now the most important thing from my uh, personal perspective and the, and the thing that triggered my interest is last year in a, on um, March 18th of 2005, for the very first time in uh, Muslim history, that for the first time in uh, 1400 years, as they say, the uh, first uh, public prayer of mixed, uh, a mixed group of men and women was led in New York City by a woman, Dr. Amina Wadud, who uh, both led the prayer and then delivered the kutbah. That was in um, uh, last March 2005, and since then there were a few pub such public prayers in Canada, one in Spain, and several in the United States. So these are the basic, basic facts with which I work. Uh, traditional Judaism, uh, like Islam, like in Islam, women are required and are encouraged to pray, but women are not encouraged to pray in the synagogue, at least not until um, uh, re relatively recently are not considered constitutive members of the quorum required for a public prayer, the minyan, and are not a necessary component of the valid public prayer. That is, they cannot hold the Torah, they cannot read from the Torah, and they cannot wear the prayer shawl, the talit, under traditional uh, Judaism. Now, if we divide uh, Judaism into the four denominations that are presently uh, known, that is, the Reform, Conservative, uh, Modern Orthodox, and uh, let's call it ultra-Orthodox, the reform of the conservative movements um, uh, underwent a revolution since the women movement started, uh, uh, what Anne Browdy talked about before, underwent a revolution since the 70s. So that today you can say that women have basically um, uh, been uh, fully integrated in reform and uh, conservative synagogues. They perform as rabbis, they perform as chazaniyot, they are uh, equal members of the minyan, and actually they are everywhere in the synagogue. I don't think you can run a synagogue of the reform or conservative movement in the United States without uh, women's participation. 
in uh, ultra, the ultra-orthodox um, uh, movement in the United States is moving more and more to the right and is pushing women more and more into their um, uh, private corner. But if you look at modern Orthodox Judaism, you see uh, significant changes. Since the late 80s, this is about 10 years after the reform and the conservative movement started to uh, um, uh, uh, implement their revolution, uh, we see in modern orthodoxy a uh, women prayer group, they call it the women tefillah groups, and what they do is they, uh, after having studied the sources quite uh, extensively, they came to the conclusion that um, um, a, a public prayer by women wearing the prayer shawl, holding the Torah, singing together, reading from the Torah, none of these are prohibited by the halakha. So there is now an effort by these women to um, uh, hold the uh, prayer groups uh, wherever they can, sometimes in the synagogue, sometimes out, out of the synagogue. Um, um, but the uh, movement is uh, proliferating and taking uh, root. Uh, uh, those of us who heard Tova Hartman uh, two days ago here, in her presentation in the evening, together with uh, Professor Casanova, Tova Hartman is one of the founders of a similar um, uh, synagogue in uh, Jerusalem, Shira Hadasha, which tries to implement egalitarian practices in Jerusalem. But as you remember, she uh, told us that there is a backlash now, and many of the tefillah groups elsewhere in Israel are being uh, either closed down or uh, discouraged by in different ways. Now to the question of what is it about the public prayer? Why is it that uh, uh, I focus on the public prayer? My argument is that the issue of women's participation in the public prayer is as important as women's rights under religious family law, uh, things that uh, Ruth Halperin Kadari was talking about, um, or women's rights to education, to work and welfare. I believe that the public prayer is as important. Uh, I take my cue from the um, United States Constitution, which is 200 years old, and the First Amendment to the United States Constitution guarantees uh, everyone's right to peace of, peace, peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. And my um, argument is that this right to peaceably assemble and uh, uh, red, uh, 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 petition the government for redress of grievances, that is rooted in ancient rituals of petitioning the king and praying to the Lord. Uh, it is a performative ritual which emphasizes the woman's place as a full and active member of the community of men and women. So I, I, my argument is that as such, it is a prerequisite to a meaningful right to vote and to an essential uh, participation in a meaningful community. Now it is because, I argue, that it is so important that uh, we see such strong resistance on the part of the opposition. It is because the public prayer is so important, so central to the uh, practice of uh, religious life that um, uh, those who consider themselves as guardians of the status quo, both men and women, by the way, um, a, uh, pose such strong resistance to the practice. Now, uh, moving to the modern liberal state. The modern, modern liberal state, which emphasizes a secular ethos and equal protection of the laws, has mostly delegated religion to the private sphere. Therefore, the question of women's rights to fully participate in the public prayer is not generally considered a matter to be decided by the state secular law. A public prayer is considered as the quintessential domain of religious law, it's a matter of belief, a matter between the people and their God. Hence, it is considered as a matter which is outside the domain of secular law. Um, I offer three models uh, of the state, that is the modern state, approach to the issue of women and public prayer. First model is the state as the arm of traditional religion, what Professor Casanova called Cesaro Papist. Because the Cesaro Papist is a state that uh, enforces uh, Catholicism, but if you want to think about, um, uh, so here, let's think about Tajikistan. So Tajikistan uh, states that um, uh, uh, came into um, uh, independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union, became a republic, and its constitution guarantees the separation of church and state. It is a rather traditional society, and traditional Islam in Tajikistan, uh, very similar to traditional Islam in Afghanistan, has denied the women's rights to attend prayer at the mosque. That is, in Tajikistan, women cannot go to the mosque. Now, in 2004, Two years ago, women tried, or a year and a half ago, uh, women tried to enter a mosque and participate in the public prayer. 
Uh, shortly thereafter, a decree was issued by the President of the Republic, that is, by the secular arm of the state. A decree was issued which prohibited women coming to the mosque. And what he said was, we never heard about it, it's not done, and we don't need it here. Uh, so now, um, uh, under this model, and I, I elaborate all of this in my paper, so I'm just giving you the uh, 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 headlines. Under this model, the state is prepared to help traditional religion to enforce itself against the challenge from progressive religious forces. Uh, politics is an important factor here because the president feels threatened by progressive Muslims for a variety of reasons that we are not going to get into. And the government is willing to support a conservative interpretation of religion for political purposes. So here is how politics and the state get into the picture of religion and gender. I move now to the second model. The second model is our own state of Israel. Uh, where the state is um, a, a, the state as a partial uh, arm of traditional religion, not as a total arm, but as a partial arm. Now, Israel is a liberal democracy uh, whose living constitution recognizes a large measure of separation of church and state. Still, religion and state in Israel, as you've heard in several of the papers that were given here, are interdependent. Uh, now, first. Uh, the facts for those people who are not um, uh, familiar with the issue, uh, 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 the conservative and the reform movements uh, which are so powerful in the United States are uh, very neg neg negligible in uh, the state of Israel. It's a small and, st they are a st small and struggling minority. The Orthodox community, um, which has monopoly over uh, religion in Israel, has only recently begun to face the challenge of the prayer groups and mostly consider these prayer groups as an alien custom brought from the United States. And these are American women who want to do this. Uh, our women are different. So nevertheless, uh, women who wish in Israel, women who wish to pray in private synagogues, such as Shura Hadashah, across the state, are not prohibited from doing so. Uh, they may establish a synagogue of members who accept the challenge to traditional Judaism and that they can uh, proceed uh, on their own. Uh, the situation is very different at the Western Wall, and some of us who are members of the uh, group who came to the United States visited there. The wall is both a, a, a sacred space, home of the ancient temple, and also a national symbol of sovereignty. The synagogue operating there at the wall is a state-run institution, and the rabbi of the wall is a public servant, and therefore that is important from the legal perspective, because as a public servant and as a state institution, uh, uh, the synagogue is supposed to be subjected to the laws of the State of Israel, which recognize equal protection of the law and free exercise of religion. So one would expect that the, law, that the state would say uh, that the women uh, should have a right to pray uh, at the wall, that is, the Tefila group. Now, uh, women who came from the United States, indeed, in, um, a, in the beginning of the 90s, one of them, Phyllis Chesler, who is one of the founders of the uh, women's uh, feminist movement in the United States in the early 70s, who slowly became more and more religious, um, uh, joined with Israeli women in the early 90s, formed a group, took a Torah scroll, and went to pray at the Western Wall. They did not go to the men's section. They went to the women's section. They wanted to pray in the women's section as a group, wearing a talit, holding the Torah, and reading from the Torah. What happened is, very shortly thereafter, violence erupted. So the men from the, sec from the uh, men's section came over to the women's section, beat the women, abused the women. They were assisted by the women in the women's section. And uh, 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 it was a quite a tumultuous um, uh, affair shown on television. Uh, and I will return to that in a second. In any event, there was litigation for a very long time, from the early 90s until uh, two years ago, until 2003, and at the end of the litigation, uh, the Supreme Court of Israel, in a five to four uh, opinion decision, denied the women the right to pray at the wall, while conceding the fact that Jewish law does not prohibit the practice. Conceding the fact that Jewish law does not prohibit the practice. The majority of the court considered traditional custom more important than the right of men and women to, e of, and women to equal exercise of religion. Again, politics played an important role. Religious parties uniformly opposed the women's prayer and weighed heavily uh, on the government in favor of the ban. Now, 
uh, a short note about the violence in the wall. Uh, in my paper, I show that the court was ready to back private violence, that is, the private violence by the male worshippers who uh, opposed the women. But the court was prepared to back the private violence with state power. How did it do so? It did so by accepting the position of the police, that the police could not stop the violence at the wall. The police said, we can't stop the violence. If you want us to stop the violence, we will have to use violence ourselves. And as a result, there will be a desecration of the wall by all of the violence. And the court says, yes, indeed, uh, this is the case. We believe the police and the women should uh, stay away from here. Uh, so the, in the important point for us to, uh, to note is that the threat of private violence by the worshippers acted as a justification to deny equal rights. Um, so this is the second model, the State of Israel, where in one place, the most significant place actually in Israel, women cannot pray, but they can pray in other places. Uh, the third model is the United States. And in the United States, uh, you do have, as I said before, uh, both movements in both Judaism, also modern Orthodox Judaism, Reform Judaism, Conservative Judaism, in Islam, uh, you have the institution of public prayer uh, in Judaism already quite well established, in Islam beginning to uh, take root, and you also have a significant body of scholarship, a significant body of scholarship on the issue of women's role within uh, the religion, in both Islam and in um, uh, Judaism. So now the question is, the interesting question uh, is, why is it that these progressive movements in both Judaism and Islam flourish in the United States? Why is it not happening else, elsewhere? And I, I argue that while the American law does not directly affect the matter, as I said, the state is not involved in public prayer, it indirectly influences the progressive movements. Uh, so now I'm going to briefly, um, and, and you'll tell me how long uh, you wish me to speak. Now, hmm? I still uh, have some time? You have 13 minutes. Okay. So, okay, so I have a few minutes left. Okay, so first, so, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to list seven factors that, in my opinion, make American law, um, a, a, a turn American law into an influence over these women who are trying to develop a, a, a basis for the public prayer in Judaism and in Islam. In the first place, um, the culture of rights. Um, uh, what is the culture of rights? Right? The culture of rights is the idea that persons of different races, genders, nationality, and religion feel that they have, as Hannah Arendt has said, a right to have rights. That is something that's very basic to American culture. And thus, either growing up in America or experiencing the socialization into American culture as an immigrant makes one develop the expectation to enjoy equal dignity, think for oneself, and partake in the civil culture. In the civic culture. If one belongs to a religious community, one may begin to experience one's exclusion from the center of uh, public religious uh, activity as otherization. The culture of rights operates to encourage challenges of the status quo and to legitimate the call for change. And actually, I can tell you that as I interviewed women who participated in the Muslim public prayer, the Friday prayer uh, with Amina Madud uh, last uh, spring, uh, several of them told me that, uh, why did, I asked, why did it happen here? And they said, well, here we can sing for ourselves. Here we are allowed to challenge. We can uh, rethink what we were told. We feel free. And that is uh, the idea of, the, of uh, you know, that's how uh, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution affects uh, the uh, idea of public prayer. So the culture of right is the first factor. The second factor is majority religious culture, uh, what I call the Christian influence and particularly the Protestant impact. Um, uh, now, uh, but let me start with an anecdote. If you consider an Orthodox Jew or an Orthodox Muslim watch, watching on TV their born-again president going to church. One fact that might appear most natural to a Christian American, but that stands out for the Jew or for the Muslim, is the fact that the First Lady stands or sits right next to her husband, and the couple is reading or singing together. The very spectacle of religious worship per performed in a gender-neutral uh, way must by itself ha have a startling impact on the believer. One begins to ask, why is it that we can't do it in the same way? So that's popular culture. But there is more to it. 
uh, particularly the Protestant way of worship, so dominant in American religious culture, with its inclusion of women in positions of power, signals that there are other ways to pursue spirituality and worship of God. Uh, furthermore, Protestantism supplies a methodology to legitimate inclusion. Under Protest Protestantism, one need not seek an authoritative answer from the Pope, from the priest, from one's rabbi, or from the imam. One is entitled to go directly to the scripture, the Hebrew Bible in the Jewish case, or the Quran in the Muslim case, and see whether it is indeed true that the sacred text designate a woman as different and inferior and exempt from the participation uh, by reason of gender. As I showed uh, in my paper, um, uh, women who had the courage to bypass patriarchal authority and examine the fundamental text independently found that neither of these sacred texts supported the banning of the female believer from the public space. The Protestant method of connecting with God, the encouragement to take an independent individualist assessment of what the world means, is a part of American culture and available to Muslim and Jewish women who seek to challenge patriarchy. And I'd like to pause here and tell you uh, a story, an anecdote from um, a play that I watched uh, last week in Israel. So to show, to show you that this Protestant spirit is coming to Israel. Um, uh, I, I, I went to see um, a Minyan Nashim, which is a play uh, in Tel Aviv. And I, I will not tell you the whole story, but it is about a woman who is a religious woman, a rebbitzin, wife of a rabbi, who left her husband. And she now comes back to Me'a She'arim, and she has a court decree to visit her children. And the rabbi of the Me'a She'arim prohibits her from watching the chil uh, uh, visiting her children. And she asks a minyan of ten women to judge her. And she tells them, if you decide that I can't see my children, I will abide by your decision. So they listen to her for the whole, this is what the play is about, and I will not tell you what it's about. I will not bore, bore you with all the details. But at the end of the long uh, uh, deliberation, the, um, a, uh, another a prominent wife of a rabbi uh, comes to the conclusion that uh, they, 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 the women decide that she can see her children. They believe her that she was abused, and they decide that she can see her children against the, the will of the rabbi. So the rabbi's wife in the play takes the phone, calls the rabbi and say, Takes your, take your thugs out of the street. There were lots of thugs there, yeshiva bochers. And uh, let us walk this woman to see her children. And there is an argument between her and the rabbi, and she says to him then, Rabbi Aaron, I'm not, I'm not afraid of you. I'm only afraid of the Ribbon Oshel Olam. I'm only afraid of the Lord. And the audience, which was at least half religious women, applauded, you know, with full force. And it was a signal to me, you know, she, that, you know, they liked it. They felt this was empowering. And what it is, is what she's saying is, I'm not listening to the rabbi because I have an, a higher authority. Now, this is Protestant. It can be Jewish, too. It can be Muslim, too. But it, it is very uh, uh, strongly uh, Protestant. So this is the second point, you know, that American law is infused by Protestant uh, culture and thereby also influences uh, legal culture in general in the United States. My third factor is constitutional jurisprudence. I will not bore you again with constitutional jurisprudence. I, most of you are not um, uh, in the legal field. But a very important um, um, mode of interpretation in the United States in the last 20 years uh, is what we call originalism. Originalism means you can cut through all the precedent and go directly to the original constitution. Now, uh, you may be interested that the reason, the, one of the reasons why originalism was invented was to enable the Supreme Court of the United States to repeal the abortion decision because the, the United States Supreme Court decided that the due process clause give women the right to abortion. If you go to the original text, you don't see there any right to abortion. So originalism would say, this is a simplistic way of, inter of, of uh, presenting it, go back to the Constitution, you don't see a right to uh, abortion. That's the end of the story. There is no right to abortion. Now, what's interesting about it? In the United States Supreme Court, in American law schools, originalism is served as a, uh, as a conservative technique. It's designed to cut certain rights that the Supreme Court of the United States uh, declared in behalf of women and other uh, minorities. But these women, uh, the Muslim and Jewish women, who are trying to develop uh, uh, a jurisprudence, 
that will support the right to public prayer, they also use originalism. They use originalism for their purposes. So what they say is, we go to the Quran and we don't find a prohibition on public prayer in the Quran. And similarly, they say that we go to the Torah and we don't see the minyan of men there. Okay? So the idea, the technique of originalism is helpful in this uh, regard um, and uh, is used by both uh, Muslim uh, 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 scholars and Jewish scholars quite extensively. The um, um, fourth, um, okay, the fourth uh, factor is uh, jurisprudence. It's uh, uh, legal formalism versus sociological jurisprudence. And just sociological jurisprudence is the idea, jurisprudence is the idea that law is a living thing. That law is developed um, uh, in, uh, in uh, conformity with the needs of the environment. Uh, um, and you can see the same thing in both the uh, Muslim and Jewish development of their respective uh, analysis. Both say the Quran is a living thing, the Torah is a living tree, and therefore we can, um, uh, 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 it's sufficiently flexible to meet our needs to the public prayer. Uh, I then go forward uh, to the fifth factor, which is uh, uh, sociological, and, uh, and sociological and philosophical scholarship. And what I show is that in both areas, both, both groups, the Muslims and the Jews, rely on secular philosophical uh, tr uh, 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 work, scholarship, such, uh, by such uh, people as uh, Sela Ben Habib, David Hollinger, Iris Marion Wright, in order, young, in order to develop their ideas. I want a few, uh, to say a few words about American history in the second half of the 20th century and how it affected uh, these women. Uh, as we all know, the uh, civil rights movement in the 60s was a very major uh, a moment in the history of American law. That is the moment when equal protection got its um, a, uh, power and significance in American legal culture. Now, um, uh, when during uh, the prayer, and all of you, I, I think, heard about Rosa Parks, who is an icon in the civil rights movement. Now, when Amina Wadud in New York led her public prayer in New York City, a man was asked how he felt, and he said, I felt like Rosa Parks. Similarly, Rosa Parks appears in a fatwa permitting women to lead mixed, uh, mixed gender prayers issued by the Islamic Center of Beverly Hills. The fatwa says, and I quote, a tiny black lady in America refused to go uh, to the back of the bus 50 years ago because she was black. She destroyed apartheid in America by her courageous action. Amina Wadud is our Rosa Parks. God bless her courage. Now, in the Jewish area, you see exactly the same thing. Uh, in a book that was published about the women of the world, Phyllis Chesler, the American uh, leader of this group, who is a very well-known feminist, talks to Anat Hoffman, the Israeli uh, representative here. Here is what Chesler asks. Says Chesler, the NAACP decided to back Rosa Parks, who on December 1955 did such and such. Says Hoffman, we are the same. Rosa Parks wasn't only about a bus issue. We are in the back of the bus, and we want to move to the front of the bus and people are telling us this is unacceptable. So she also feels that she is a Rosa Parks. And here is how uh, the American civil rights movement is uh, influential in both areas. And finally, I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, uh, this is very typical of, minority, uh, my, uh, of minorities. Uh, uh, both Muslims and Jews, Jews in the beginning of the 20th century, Muslims today, try to show Americans that they are not an exotic, um, a strange, kind of religion, that they are universalist in the, in the Jewish area. In the Jewish case, it's the Ahavta Lerea Chakamocha. Muslims also have universalist principles that they can show. And there is an effort, uh, those of you who will look at uh, Muslim websites in the United States will see it clearly, to show Americans that Muslims are not uh, uh, crazy terrorists, uh, all Osama bin Laden's, but rather that Islam is a very um, um, a gentle, and uh, peace-seeking religion. So this effort to integrate into the mainstream, to show the mainstream that our religion is universalist, also works in, um, uh, in favor of this um, uh, effort to legitimate the public prayer. Before we have a party, 
as uh, <laughs> Tamar uh, uh, questioned yesterday, I would like to say that there is this issue of the center and the periphery. And the center of Islam is in the Middle East rather than in the United States. The center of Judaism, there is a question of where it is, but certainly today uh, rabbis in Jerusalem uh, try to um, uh, solidify their uh, predominance here. Now, the more the center is in the Middle East, the less the uh, 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 minorities in the United States will feel free to uh, uh, exercise their uh, rights because there is a great push from here to there to, um, uh, to uh, conform. So you have uh, 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 in, uh, a dialogue, actually a conversation between the periphery and the center and it's not clear yet which way things are gonna go. So I want to conclude with, uh, from, uh, with uh, you know, what I would call uh, from description to prescription. So the question is, what is there to do? And actually, I, I want to conclude with a question rather than with a proposition. I want to conclude by asking all of us, and this is the thing that really interests me, uh, what should we do with state law? That is, most of the states, actually, that we are talking about have a measure of religion in their law and the uh, government is willing to support religion in a certain way. So the question is, what is it that we should do? Should we uh, push law, that, it, that is the state, to help the women directly by uh, forcing traditional religion to conform and to allow women to exercise their right? That is, should we choose the direct confrontation or should we do it in a, more, in a softer, indirect way uh, in order to avoid the backlash. And so the question basically is, how do you avoid the backlash? What is the most, the wisest way, okay, to assure the, uh, the ma maximum of success in this area? Thank you very much. Uh, well, I just have to um, take a little credit uh, that uh, Amina Wadud, the Muslim Rosa Parks, I just learned, um, is a former research associate oh, wow. in the Harvard Divinity School <laughs> Women's Studies and Religion program, and we're very, we're very proud of her. Um, uh, and I'm pleased to announce another, uh, to introduce another former research associate, uh, Professor Nayira Tohidi, Associate Professor of Women's Studies at California. Aren't you so in sociology too? Yeah. Yeah, um, Women's we Studies and Sociology. <laughs> at California State University, Northridge. She's also um, a Keddie Balzan Fellow at the Center for Near Eastern Studies at UCLA, and she has written extensively on gender, religion, democracy, and women's rights in the Middle East and in post-Soviet Central, <coughs> post Central Eurasia, especially Iran and Azerbaijan. Uh, she's the recipient of several grants and research awards, including Fulbright Scholarship in the former Soviet Union, um, uh, postdoctoral fellowships at the Hoover <coughs> Institute of Stanford University, and the Kennan Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center, as well as her Harvard Fellowship. Her recent book, Globalization, Gender, and Religion, The Politics of Women's Rights in Catholic and Muslim Contexts, has been published by Palgrave University Press. And today she will speak about gender, the blind, spot, the, the blind spot of Islamic reformation and democracy in the Muslim world. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank the organizers of this wonderful and timely conference especially Dr. Hanan, Hannah Herzog uh, from the Landir uh, Jerusalem Institute and Dr. Anne Brody, director of uh, the Women's Studies in Religion program at Harvard Divinity School. And for those of you who don't know about this program, and if you are qualified to apply, I <laughs> encourage you to apply. It's a wonderful, unique program. Uh, available for those of us who do uh, research on gender and religion. It was uh, my year at Harvard and at the Divinity School with this special program was one of the most uh, enriching and stimulating years in, in my academic life. 
I also like to thank Ms. Knerit Lahad and Ms. Nora uh, Rayan for all uh, and all other uh, staff and graduate students who helped organizing this very well organized and warmly hospitable conference. <clears throat> uh, having taught and researched on women uh, in Muslim societies for years and especially having given public lectures in uh, the Western context and also uh, in Muslim context, which have been very different experience. Um, I have learned to be careful whenever I begin a lecture, uh, even a semester of teaching uh, one of my favorite courses, which is Women in Muslim Societies, to always uh, bring with some preliminary caveats and some um, kind of, you know, as you said, disclaimers. <laughs> Um, and uh, that is because uh, there has been so much misunderstanding and uh, simplified stereotypes and one-sided ideas about Islam in general and women in Muslim societies in particular. Uh, so that's why whenever I talk about the women in the Muslim world even or Muslim women, all these terms uh, I like to draw our attention that uh, should be problematized and should, should always be used with understanding that uh, like any, in any other parts of the world, uh, women's status in the Islamic societies is diverse, is, uh, it varies from one country to another and even within one country depending on the class status and age and ethnicity and so forth. Um, so, because uh, these categories of Muslim women or Muslim world have been used in essentialized and uh, orientalized ways uh, frequently, fortunately less so recently, uh, but, but again there has been kind of um, regress to orientalism again after post, I mean the post September 11 um, context. Um, given the um, extreme misogyny that the world observed by the Taliban in Afghanistan and the whole tragedy of September 11, uh, the association of a negative image uh, of Islam with violence, with um, abuse of women, has been kind of reinforced again, especially by TV watchers. <laughs> so that's why it's... Uh, Kind of, I feel compelled uh, to, uh, whenever I talk about this topic, first to, to draw again our attention that uh, there is so much diversity. For example, right now when um, Professor uh, Pinina Lahaf was talking about uh, Tajikistan in her interesting paper, um, public prayer, I mean, prayer for women in mosques is so. Uh, customary and happens everywhere, almost everywhere in Muslim countries. Uh, so what happened in Tajikistan was kind of a transitional post-Soviet uh, issue. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, it's not pu public praying of women, although women stand behind men in, in the mosque and participate in public praying. But what Amina Wadud is doing, which is revolutionary and innovative, is that she wants to, first of all, lead the prayer, and that is not what acceptable. Um, not that she's participating only with, with, in a public prayer. Uh, not only she's, she wants to lead the prayer, but she wants to lead a mixed prayer. That is, she wants men and women to stand next to each other instead of women standing behind men. So that is the innovative part. So again, I want you to remember that uh, not to generalize that women everywhere cannot participate in public prayer. So uh, like even in Central Asia, in Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan, women do participate in mosques and public prayer, but, but again, in a discriminatory way, that is, they have to stand them behind men. Um, <clears throat> now, um, the other uh, point I wanted to mention, uh, even though uh, Fortunately, the recent scholarship and even more sophisticated media reports have become less stereotypical and are trying to catch uh, 
beneath the uh, sensational images about some of the positive and hopeful trends that are happening within the Islamic societies and within the Islamic tradition. And uh, so maybe I'm one of those who is less uh, pessimistic among uh, our speakers here, and maybe my, uh, my talk uh, may sound, uh, uh, but again, I have been told that I'm very optimistic and sometimes maybe naively. But uh, anyway, I actually, in, in even not, not in short term, but in medium and long term, see very positive prospect for women in uh, Muslim societies in particular, and women's status in general in, in the global, uh, at the global level. Um, so what, what I want to start uh, talking about is I'm going to kind of first to make these um, brief uh, kind of background statements and then uh, talk about uh, what are the trends, the main trends uh, within the Islamic discourse today and how women are responding to these trends and how they are showing their agency and how they are bringing about uh, changes. Historically speaking, uh, the concern about women's rights in the Islamic world is not new. Uh, progressive female and male reformers inside the Muslim societies have been calling for women's emancipation for over a hundred years now. Many Muslim modernist reformers have viewed the improvement in the status of women as a prerequisite for socioeconomic development and overall progress of Islamic societies. Thanks to a strong reform movement in Turkey, for example, women won the right to vote in 1930 and stood for election in 1934, long before women in France, which happened in 1944, or Switzerland in 1971, and in many other non-Islamic countries. Again, historically speaking, Sexism has not been peculiar to the Islamic world nor to the Islamic religion. In pre-modern times, women's status and rights in Islamic tradition and societies were no worse than in other societies or traditions. What is peculiar, however, is that a visible gap has emerged in modern times between the Islamic world and the Christian West with regard to the degrees of egalitarian improvement in women's rights. Why such a gap? Why most women in most of the Muslim majority countries have not yet enjoyed the same rights, especially rights pertaining to personal status and family law, that women in the Christian majority West uh, and some non-Western parts of the world gained during the 20th century. This gender-related gap in the Muslim world is obviously related to an overall gap in economic, industrial, and socio-political development. Yet the present extent of discrimination against women in the Muslim world cannot be explained away by referring to the overall underdevelopment. Uh, particularly in those Muslim societies such as Saudi Arabia and Iran that have achieved a considerable degree of urbanization and modernization. Nor can it be simply attributed to the religion of Islam per se. So how can then one uh, explain this gender gap? Uh, I have written extensively on this, so I, I can't really uh, spend much time on that. I have talked about the legacy of... Um, Colonialism. I have even talked about the geographical factors contributed to this, uh, the tribal nature of some of the societies uh, that still have remained tribal, and also about, and especially about uh, the different process of modernization and secularization that went on in the Muslim countries compared to the European Western context. The modernization process, which has been mostly in the Muslim world, especially in the uh, post-colonial uh, context, has been top-down, state-oriented, authoritarian, usually done by military officers, uh, by states that have not been seen very legitimate and popular by majority of people. So in the previous session when um, one of our speakers was talking about Egypt and giving the example of, for example, Jahan, uh, 
Sadat, imagine a, a government which is not seen necessarily popular, elected, democratically elected, and uh, non-corrupt, um, to just monopolize a sort of state feminism and tell women what is emancipatory for them without letting any NGOs, letting any independent women's organizations, any you know, independent uh, uh, genuine women's agency to, to flourish in, in society. So in countries like Egypt, or also somewhat similar to the state feminism in the Soviet Union, that we know the shortcomings and problems with it, and the, the, ver the modernization version of the Soviet Union, similar also to the process of modernization in Iran, on, and the way that Francis Ashraf, the twin sister of the Shah, Again, an unpopular, unelected a government that came to power by a coup d'etat uh, helped by CIA. That kind of government cannot uh, begin a, ref a reform process or a secularization process or emancipation of women and still be able to mobilize masses of women behind that project. So one of the reasons then it has created rather than support for this kind of, uh, you know, uh, modernization projects, it has created backlash because of all these political reasons, not necessarily cultural and not necessarily religious reasons. So we have to understand the politics behind uh, the state policies and the nature of the state, and especially this deficit, the democracy deficit. So that's why I'm arguing that the gender issue is the blind spot of democracy, because without democracy, you cannot resolve the question of gender and the question of emancipation in the Muslim world. But again, without women's emancipation, you don't have democracy. So it has become a vicious circle which needs to be uh, untangled. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that we, if, if we think that it is Islam and it is uh, the culture that is preventing women's emancipation in these societies, then I would ask why is it that while most social, economic, and political institutions, including uh, many aspects of law in the Muslim world, have been relatively secularized and modernized, yet the family law and personal status have remained so resistant to reform and to secularization. If it is Islam if it being, you know, uh, resistant to change and to reform, then why, for example, a state man like Nasser in Egypt or uh, Zia ul Haq in Pakistan or <clears throat> Reza Shah in Iran, uh, or a secular, I mean, uh, those are secular statements, but also religious authorities such as a grand Ayatollah uh, or a grand Sony Mufti in the Sony context can change the name of the usury by stroke of a pen. And you know that usury, that is uh, lending, the lending of money uh, with an interest, which is uh, forbidden in Islam. But we know that in all Muslim, almost all Muslim countries, they have just played with, around with it and they have called it service fee. Therefore, they have secularized the banking system. They have modern Western banking system. And of course, there is capitalist motivation behind it, so it can be easily resolved. But when it comes to even slight reform in Sharia, in Islamic law, uh, about the family law, about women's rights, for example, divorce, uh, child custody, it takes years of struggle of thousands of women to bring about that change. And of course, who resists the change and how in the name of religion. So that's why I want to, uh, to again draw our attention that uh, as one of the prominent uh, feminist activists in Iran, Nushin Ahmadi Khurasani recently wrote that <clears throat> she said uh, kind of in a satiric and polemic way that, uh, let me read the quote exactly, when we Muslim women cook your meals in the Western-made microwave ovens and wash your clothes in Western-made 
washing machines, you do not, you do not call us westernized. <laughs> but when we demand changes in our rights similar to the ones enjoyed by Western women, you blame us for becoming westernized. <laughs> so obviously, the real power dynamic behind the resistance to reform uh, against the family law and personal status is related to patriarchy, to the gender system, rather than to religion of Islam per se. And this is also related to the way that the state male elite maintains and nurtures patriarchy. And based on a tacit and unwritten agreement between the repressive male state elite and the authority of religious institutions and ordinary male citizens in terms of distribution of power between the so-called public sphere under the control of the state elite and the private sphere under the control of the uh, religious authorities and the male head of the household. I have seen this process of this tacit negotiation and you know, between the different elites, uh, also in the, even in the secular context of uh, post-Soviet Central Asia. If you are interested, you can read my uh, analysis on Azerbaijan and the way S Stalin actually negotiated with the Muslim elite in Central Asia, uh, kind of leading them to deal with their women and the family issues and the whole rhetoric about equality, the Soviet rhetoric about equality was kind of sacrificed in order to uh, have the support of the Muslim elite in, in Central Asia. But that's another issue that I want to say that it's, it's happening in many contexts. Um, so, what I'm, I'm using these examples to point uh, to the main themes of this conference, that is the interplay between religion, uh, gender, and politics, which has been uh, elaborated in many papers, uh, especially by uh, Professor Jose Casanova and uh, Professor Hannah Herzog and uh, others. So, I. I I'm trying to say that although religion is very important, but it is only one determinant of women's status and, uh, and women's rights, and even that determination and that impact is always mediated, conditioned, and modified through socioeconomic factors and uh, politics and state policies. However, the recent surge in Islamism and Islamic fundamentalism and the recent instrumentalization of religion have practically increased the significance of the role of Islam, especially Sharia, in women's lives and in the, in, uh, related to gender question, which I will talk about it uh, in a moment. But first, I want to emphasize another point that what is going on in the Muslim world is actually an intra-civilizational fight and tension rather than clash of civilizations. It is, the fight is primarily happening within the Islamic world rather than between the Muslims and non-Muslims. Similar to the early years of emerging modernity in the West, the primary tension in many Islamic societies is between the conservative traditionalist, traditionalist and liberal modernists, each adhering to different views toward women and gender roles. Yet, there are some important differences between sociopolitical dynamics uh, that shape the Western process of modernization, religion reformation, and secularization, and thereby the process of women's emancipation, without understanding those uh, differences, as I just mentioned a few of them, we may fall in the trap of perceiving the gender issues in the Muslim societies today from a very simplistic binary perspective that is modern versus traditional or religious versus secular. In line with uh, scholars like Fatima Mernisi, uh, I have argued that the rise in Islamism in recent decades is in part, in part, 
due to the rise in women's expectations and demands in the Muslim world. In other words, Islamism is in part a patriarchal protest movement. It's, it's protesting, it is resisting a trend of change in women's roles as an inevitable consequence of rapid modernization and socioeconomic transformation in this era of globalization. Current gender crisis, and specifically crisis in masculinity in most parts of the Muslim world is related not only to a sense of being in a state of siege, overpowered and humiliated by the Western hegemonic intrusion into the Darul Islam on the one hand and repressive, corrupt national states on the other, but also the threatening changes in the male-female power dynamics, which is aimed at taking away the male domination and control over the household. That is the, rem the only remaining bastion of control and authority for the male. The male who is feeling insecure, humiliated, and already disempowered. Now, about this crisis, I have done a lot of uh, studies and in my paper that will, I will hopefully send you by email soon, I have given a lot of facts and figures to show you that um, I'm not just you know, imagining these things. There is really a, a process of profound socioeconomic and cultural changes going on especially demographic changes, increasing urbanization, modernization, higher literacy rates, and the emergence of a new middle class women as well as men, have, and especially professional and highly educated women, have created a growing constituency supportive of democracy of equal rights, uh, including democratization of intra-family relationship and gender relationship. Over the recent decades, women's literacy rates and educational attainment, even at the ter uh, tertiary level, have risen dramatically in the Middle East and North Africa, and, and also, also other regions of the Muslim world. In Iran, for example, the literacy rate among women has risen from 37% in 1975 to 76% in 2000, and as of 2002, over 60% of university enrollment is female. This rising trend in literacy rates has been associated with a considerable improvement in women's health care, life expectancy, and very important, decline in fertility rates. All of which have contributed to a rise in female employment, even in the Middle East, which has been uh, traditionally known for lower rate of female uh, participation rates in labor force. According to the UNDP, female participation in the labor force has nearly doubled, in the, in, even in the Arab world, which, as I said, has been uh, usually lowest uh, rate. And it has, I, there are theories for that, too, that why, why it has been low, especially it has been argued that the, the oil-centered economy is usually less women-friendly in employing women. But that's, again, another discussion. Uh, in, since 1995, the, the rate has increased from 17% to 33% in 2004. Uh, and again, the, in other parts of the Muslim world, for example, if you compare Saudi Arabia, which is not more than 20%, uh, in uh, Indonesia, it is 56%. In Bangladesh, 66%. Turkey, 51%. Malaysia, 49%. So you see that this growing active employed women who are earning salaries, who are moving toward uh, demand for autonomy and uh, are developing different expectations about gender roles. And another... Um, again, important uh, factor which is happening in mo many Muslim societies is this youth bulge. That is, 60% uh, of the population in Muslim world uh, is under 25 years old. And the, this younger people in most of these countries are, especially in this era of globalization, are, of course, changing 
uh, their attitudes are going toward uh, more egalitarian attitudes in sexual in sexuality with regard to sexual mores and in uh, family relationship in, uh, and challenging the, patri the old patriarchy and so forth. Another thing uh, which has important implications is delayed marriage and the increasing number of single women and, um, and the age of marriage has increased a lot. The Middle East actually uh, uh, for example, that, uh, while marriage has remained the road to adulthood, uh, but young people marry at later age in the Middle East than anywhere else in the globe. 31 years of age for men and 23 for women. Early marriage among young women in the Middle East has fallen more dramatically than anywhere else in the globe. Uh, this, of course, creates an uh, untenable limbo for, for people uh, uh, between the prevailing conservative norms which forbid sexual relations, especially by the ruling Islamists, and the increasing uh, difficulty and at times unbearable costs of marriage and dowry and mahriye and so forth. And compare this reality with the Sharia law and see how lagged and how far behind it has remained. In Iran, for example, according to the law, which is based on Sharia, the mi minimum age for marriage, initially when the Islamic revolution happened, was, no was reduced to nine years for girls and 13 years for boys. Thanks to the efforts of reformers in the sixth parliament, especially women, ref uh, Muslim feminist reformers within the parliament, that age uh, was uh, increased to, raised to uh, 13 for girls and uh, 15 for boys. But still, uh, the Guardian Council made a change, a little change in it, and said that, okay, yeah, this is the legal age, but parents, especially fathers, can appeal to the Sharia court, or in uh, Turkey, or in Iran under the Shah, as, as an assertion of a new identity and a protest to the version of modernization that these governments are um, proposing, and also in diaspora immigrant communities. So you see this trend of uh, uh, identity politics in, uh, with an Islamic, for example, dress code women, but at the same time women who are after education and professional uh, in Europe, for example, in North America and so forth. So here, you, these women are actually negotiating with modernity. These are the women who are either children of the first generation of immigrants or the, the recently urbanized women in the uh, uh, Muslim majority societies who are not necessarily trying to go back or they are not actually, they are kind of uh, trying to negotiate and find a way without alienating themselves from the community and from their parents uh, to, to move into the uh, an, an professional, active social life with a modern style of living and thinking. So that, those are not necessarily fundamentalists, and for them Islam is mostly, and this kind of identity is mostly cultural rather than ideological. That's why you see that they emphasize collective public prayer more so than private uh, prayer at their home because they want to assert their distinction and they want to resist absorption in the globalization process. And the third um, group that are uh, rights oriented are the ones that mostly make up the Muslim feminists and they are the ones who are questioning, uh, the reinterpreting using ishtihad in a very dynamic way, what they call fiqh puya or dynamic jurisprudence and they are usually aligned with new Islamic thinkers, uh, both clerics and lay, like uh, um, Abdul Karim Sroush in, in Iran, or, uh, or Shabestari, or Kadivar, Saeed Zadeh, and Malikian, uh, and many others. And um, the, the, these are the women like Shirin Ebadi, uh, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2003, the first Muslim woman ever winning uh, Nobel Prize, who considers herself a Muslim but at the same time feminist. She's, she doesn't, she's not afraid of calling herself a feminist. Or women like um, 
uh, Aziz Al Hebri or Amina Wadud that you talked about. Uh, by the way, Amina Wadud had this uh, public uh, leading prayer in 2001, first in South Africa. So it first happened in South Africa. I wanted to tell you before I forget that. Uh, so th these are the women who are uh, who had their first Congress of Islamic Feminism in Madrid, Spain. That should interest. Uh, Jose Casanova uh, in just uh, last October, and it went very well. If you go to the website of Islamic Feminist, uh, I think they call it Feminist Islamic, www.org, uh, Feminist Islamic, you see their uh, resolution uh, and how they are calling uh, uh, gender for gender jihad. And uh, interestingly, gender jihad is the title of uh, Amina Wadud's forthcoming book. Who, who was one of the speakers of, at this conference, at this Congress. And incidentally, I'm invited to participate in the second Congress, which is going to happen next year. And, and this, is, this is happening. This is an interesting, fascinating process of global, local interplay of uh, a quiet feminist movement and feminist intervention within the reform movement in Islam that should be welcome and taken seriously, even though in short run maybe we are not hearing much about them and they are not making much uh, you know, news, uh, but that is a promising trend that makes uh, the process of democratization uh, more hopeful and promising in the context of Islamic. Sorry I went beyond my time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, we did go just a little bit over, so I am going to ask Tamar to go uh, ahead with, and we'll save all questions for after we hear from uh, Tamar. Okay. I was so eager to hear what she had to say <laughs> that I neglected to tell you that uh, Tamar El Or is a senior lecturer at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Hebrew University, Jerusalem and head of the Lafer Center for Gender Studies and Research. Among her publications are the books Educated and Ignorant on Ultra-Orthodox Women and Their World, and Next Year I Will Know More, Literacy and Identity Among Young Orthodox Women in Israel. A third book on Orthodox women in the Mizrahi Sephardi community is forthcoming. Thank and you. Tamar is going to <laughs> help us collect our thoughts to reflect on the, the stimulating three days that we've had. Well, thank you very much. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to try and do the Israeli renowned um, major thing that Israelis do is improvise as, and see if it can work. Um, before that, I would like to do the last thank uh, for to uh, Hannah Herzog and to to Anne Brody for putting this thing together and uh, to thank anyone who and everyone who had um, a role and especially maybe to Anat Lapidot who is not here tonight for having the, the talent of putting or being the major person who put the, the sessions together and uh, having to guess via the abstracts what is it going to be. I mean everybody helped her but she had a sort of sense of how to put together the panels, which helps me a lot now in trying to uh, wrap it up or sort of be the anthropologist of the conference and uh, try to say as, uh, what was actually going on in this conference. So the first thing is I'm, I will not attempt to, to go back to each and every paper and, uh, and, and, and mention it, but try to um, see whether I can locate the temperament, the atmosphere uh, of, of the conference. And I would like to use maybe three keywords that will help me and maybe help you to think backward and maybe forward about the conference. One that has to do with the meta narrative that sort of accompanied or followed the, the conference. One that has to do with the positionality, the power relations, the ethics of feminist researchers in the area of gender, religion, and politics. And the last one that has to do maybe with more with gender um, or going into gender um, through a certain concept. So the first one that has to do with meta-narratives, I will use 
or I will relate to uh, the keyword progress. The second one that has to do with power and ethics and positionality, I will try to use the word generosity and see what I can do with generosity. And the last one, which is not surprising, uh, I will try to see how when I go back to the notion or to the uh, concept of the body, uh, what did we hear here special or, or um, strongly uh, when we sort of bring many, many of the papers together. So let me start with progress. Uh, from the first night, which seems to be like it was like 100 years ago, <laughs> Um, it's been very intense, and, 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 and I think the ambience is also an ambience of a conversation, which, which kept being beyond the papers, there was a, a, there was a conversation. Um, it seems to me that um, we have given up um, an attempt to um, overlook enlightenment, progress, um, and the whole parcel that enlightenment and progress as a meta-narrative that was a sort of a faux pas in feminist discourse, in sociologists, in, in the discourse of sociology and especially in anthropology, or was something that had to be uh, negated, uh, deconstructed, has come up um, and followed us uh, throughout the papers, sort again as, as a meta-narrative of course, we are never going back to the discourse of enlightenment or to discourse of desecularization, oh, secularization or uh, uh, going against religion, or we are going again, uh, back to a discourse of uh, um, illiteracy and literacy. It's just that it seems to me that now we are, or democracy, or democratic, uh, turning uh, uh, countries, you know, going into the process of democratization. But it's, it's here, and most of, from, from the first evening with the opening night, uh, both the papers of Professor Casanova and uh, Dr. Tova Hartmann, uh, the, the hope is that with democracy, things will change. So uh, as an anthropologist as, and a feminist, I was, um, I was, um, I couldn't say taught or, um, made or, or, but I was urged, encouraged from the 80s or mainly in, in, in the 80s as a PhD student to see if we can give up democracy to, as, as, as a whole, to see if we can go to multiculturalism, to see if we can put aside at least a social order, one unified social order that is our that will, that will change the world, that will do things differently. And see if we can uh, be um, um, attuned to other uh, social orders and not uh, impose as feminists this parcel of enlightenment that brings together democracy, capitalism, liberalism, feminism, uh, secularism, education, health, et cetera, et cetera, as a parcel. So um, everybody here is, 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 is familiar with this discourse. Everybody here has gone through those processes and combated with them. It seems to me that uh, wiser with lots of scars on our bodies um, and we are slowly, slowly trying to come back and see whether we can talk now differently about uh, democracy. So it's one thing to talk about what the United States is offering the religious experience, be it Islam or Christianity or Judaism. And it offers a lot, especially as, as, as we know and as we heard from the academic papers. Um, how can it offer a democratic experience, experiences elsewhere? Here, for example, in other countries of the Middle East. Do we really still need to lean and continue to lean on democracy? When will it come? Uh, how will it come? Uh, it was here, anyways. It was here, the, the, the discourse of, of democracy, of civil rights, of education, of health, of, of literacy rates, of birth rates, um, things that we were sort of cautious 
caution to talk about, I think, as anthropologists in the late 80s, as, as, a, as a whole, as a parcel. So this is one thing um, that I invite you to think about. And that brings me to generosity as a position, as a positionality, as uh, an ethic uh, place. From where do we speak? How generous can we be towards religions, different religions, religions that are not uh, allowing a democratic experience or equality? Um, this was very, very complicated here, and it came in very many different ways. And there was a, a so, I think I would like to present it in two levels. First of the level, really, of the researcher. Uh, it came many times with the uh, tension of going from generosity to empathy to critique to rage to, at some level, maybe just being tired of of fighting and fighting and seeing very little results or, uh, or some results. So there was, I think, a tendency to, when, are, when can we be generous uh, when we are uh, coming from the state, when we are coming from a democratic country, when I am coming as a non-Orthodox person to watch and study the life of ultra-Orthodox women or Orthodox women, then I can be generous, then I can see the empowerment, those little, little empowerments that I see and celebrate them. What does it mean when you are um, an Orthodox person, when you live in the Middle East, when you live in a non-democratic society, when you try to experience your religiosity uh, in this situation, can you be as generous? This is a serious question. And when you're an academic and a, an activist, and, it ha and we heard several papers coming from persons, be them Orthodox, uh, women Orthodox, uh, feminist and activist, Palestinian um, feminist, um, uh, uh, female, and a Palestinian activist male, who was very bewildered about the generosity, what sort of the generosity of the state of Israel towards the pa Palestinian patriarchy, towards all kinds of different religions here. Uh, does, he want, does he want this generosity? Can he afford this generosity? What, when can we afford generosity when we cannot, we cannot stand it? Um, um, so there is the critique in between, and we were trying to bounce and say, yes, we need to try and hold this rope on its, in two edge, on, on its two ends, but uh, sometimes when I think when we heard the activists, um, more uh, um, people were more um, um, reluctant to celebrate uh, things that I have been celebrating through my subject of research, especially in the modern Orthodox community, and maybe it, it's good that we have those two positions where I am from the outside maybe can see um, uh, um, uh, processes that will take a lot of time. And when you, are, when you live them and when you fight those battles, you get tired. And I, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting books written and articles written, and, and I make my career on, 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 on the top of your bodies. I have a lot of, of empathy, and I feel, I feel sisterhood, and uh, I feel part of it, but I, I don't have to live it day by day. And I can understand that sometimes you just get fed up. And when you don't see the results in your lifetime, and you have to look, and, and, I, can, and I can experience it from, from my battlefields, which are different battlefields, but I can understand that, and I have full appreciation for that. And sometimes, like for example, uh, when we, and, and the sexiness, and, and how nice is it to talk about uh, stuff that is being changed uh, in, in the ultra-Orthodox life um, when, when we know that maybe we are, we are serving here or I am serving here sometimes as um, someone who can afford um, uh, the life of the other. Um, the third sort of point of, for thinking uh, is the body, which of course comes in any feminist discussion, in any queer theory discussion, of course, um, and came here in very interesting, different ways. 
um, first of all, it's always amazing how the body as a, as a, as a, as a space is such a, an important billboard for any religious uh, uh, project. It's just like it's such a, such a convenient place to hang your ideologies, to, to uh, mold, uh, to, to create um, identities, to work with, with the physical, with the physical, sexual, erotic, working, thinking body. It's, it's just there. Um, the project of modernizing the body that came here in, in very different uh, uh, ways. I think maybe we haven't thought enough or talked enough. There was a sort of an opportunity in one of the paper to talk about moments of secularism in the history of different societies that came up here, be it Egypt or Turkey or Israel. The United States might be different. I know less of the United States as a researcher. Moments, especially maybe in the 40s and in the 50s, it struck me and I thought about it that I was like three months ago in Istanbul and I was walking down Istiklal Street and one of the buildings was reconstructed and they put on the, on the building a picture of Istiklal Street. I think it was in the 30s, late 30s, the same street. And I was looking at the picture and it looked almost, I mean, not looking in the very, very detailed uh, faces, etc. but the general atmosphere was of a European city, men in suits, women in, you know, the other suits, uh, black cars, uh, everybody looked very European. I know those pictures coming from Baghdad, I know those pictures coming from Cairo, from, this, from the big cities in, in the 40s and 50s when the project of modernization and living under the British mandate or living under other empires, European empires, created an urbanic space that of course there were the villages and of course there were all those majority of people that were not part of this Cairo or, or this Istiklal Street. I know that. But from looking at that, there was a sort of a moment of, of similarity that when I turned away and looked at the Istiklal Street of 2005, it was then, it was a total different Istiklal Street. On one end, you had men and women wearing jeans and T-shirts and all that, and you had a lot of veil, and, and of course the style is lost. The style is lost as we saw in, in the picture of the women from now. You know, look at the style. They had style. We were just, you know, wearing our rags and stuff like that. So um, mo those moments, no, I'm saying, um, you know, take it as it is. Um, uh, there were moments of, of when the modern modernization project had a hold that maybe we need to come back to those moments and see uh, all kinds of similarities that we hold that we can think of um, uh, and that we sort of erase them. Of course, there was the, the sexuality part that I will not go into. I will just talk about all kinds of uh, othering and othering, the, the old uh, Sherry Ortner, female to male as nature to culture equation, debated equation, uh, equation and criticized, and yet very powerful thing of the body as the male and then the female and then the black and then the orthodox and then the Palestinian and then the Palestinian female and then all those uh, uh, sorts of different bodies that appeared and, and filled this room, the black body and uh, the brown body uh, and, the, and the, the body that turns from a female to a male, uh, all those bodies really filled this room and, and reminded us again and again that uh, other than a metaphor, as was said here, these are very physical uh, bodies. The last thing that I want to uh, just sort of uh, signal out, maybe also for thinking, that also wraps uh, some of the papers, is the religion as a sort of a visa or a passport. Um, an option to go places, an option to cross param other parameters of class, of, of race, of gender, of uh, continents, of uh, political um, um, uh, parties, and, uh, et cetera. So we heard a lot about religion not only as confining you to a certain place, but also allowing you to, to cross and to go and to become something new and to make yourself anew and to invent yourself and to construct yourself as a very creative, on, 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 we know the other end of it, when your passport is stamped stay at home, 
uh, or you're not granted the passport, but sometimes, as we saw it, it was a very powerful uh, passport too. The last thing that I want to say uh, will bring me back to this discussion of democracy and progress, which is it's a, it's a, very, it's a, it's a very bothering and very acute, I think, uh, discourse, where are we going? Um, are we pessimistic? You know, as I said, are we celebrating? Are we pessimistic? Um, I, tend to be, I tend to be very optimistic, usually. Um, I know it maybe didn't come up here. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I tend to be very optimistic, and I think that um, uh, when I heard Tova the first night, it was very painful for me to hear her, because people around um, uh, this place for sure, Jerusalem, she's a figure that um, gives hope to a lot of women and men. Um, um, and um, I, I sort of saw her so tired, and the patriarchy came back again, this, this sort of, of, of demon that came back and said, I'm here, and I'm still hungry, and I want my food, and it's not going to be easy. Um, and maybe this... Um, between seeing the potential of democracy or democratic experiences to, to be more present in places where they're, it's still missing. And through this, um, as, and as, as it was really nicely presented, and as both the two lost paper asked, how should we do it gently? Not to really to evoke the, the bear, you know, that this patriarchy, hungry bear, and to go around, are we going back to our grandmother's techniques, you know, just go and just don't show him that you're doing it? Or as you said, are we going to confront? Are we going to do it from state up, as it was mentioned here? Because um, we take Turkey many times as the great example, you know. There it wasn't made from below, it was made from, are we then risking a backlash? Um, it seems to me that the most um, optimistic thing or tool, political, theoretical, ethical, that I can come back to, which is very feminist, is, is the, 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 the tool or the notion of coalitions. Let's make, continue and make coalitions, ad hoc coalitions. Um, uh, even if things, if the, the situations are not ripe, if we need to make coalitions with non-democratic situations, with the non-equal situations, but by doing this we can uh, promote other issues that are worth promoting, um, we can do that even without waiting for this progress, for this um, new enlightenment uh, to come. Well, I think the uh, Israeli penchant for extemporizing has been uh, proven valuable. Uh, thank you, Tamar. Um, let, we now have a half hour of uh, concluding discussion, and I'd like to take discussions both of the papers and uh, regarding the conference in general. Uh, uh, well, Malik. I have a few comments on um, both the uh, 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 lecture and uh, my um, uh, First, uh, Nina, uh, you talked about uh, uh, reading things uh, uh, by the Muslim uh, uh, feminists uh, uh, in the US. There is a Fatma Melissi yeah. in uh, uh, Morocco yeah. that is dealing with reading the Quran differently. And she goes backward just just to mention it. Yes, yes. Okay. And these feminists use her. Yeah, of course. Just yeah. I, I yes, didn't yes. hear so that in your very important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, to my uh, I've heard it and it was uh, uh, illuminating, but I have a few comments. Sure. Um, first, um, you've talked about the reformists of the uh, 19th uh, century, or the turn of the 19th uh, century, the beginning of the 20th uh, century. And I must say that they haven't spoken for women on behalf of loving women or uh, uh, the, the will to liberate them. Of course, uh, pure interest uh, of uh, liberating or, or creating a modern uh, nation uh, per se, and, uh, uh, nothing, uh, nothing more or less. Now, about the Turkish uh, example, uh, we have to stress that uh, uh, the uh, Atatürk, Mustafa Kemal, adopted 
the Swiss uh, uh, constitution back in the 1930s, and uh, we can hardly say that the, the Turkish exam, uh, the, the, the Swiss example, uh, uh, is very uh, uh, liberated or modern, since only in the end of the 1960s, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, women got suffrage. Uh, 72, 72, 71, 72, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, regarding Turkey as well, uh, um, in the veil issue, uh, uh, Atatürk was uh, uh, utterly uh, pro uh, 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 devailing women, but unlike the uh, uh, prerequisite uh, uh, of male uh, of, of the men to uh, 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 lower uh, to, to take off their fez, uh, it wasn't. It was a prerogative. Uh, in the case of women, he knew he wouldn't be able to uh, uh, enact it as uh, a legal binding uh, thing in the, in the parliament. There was a backlash in, in the parliament uh, in that issue. Um, now, you've talked about um, uh, the nation state as um, um, being able or not being able to make reforms and um, in, uh, in the context of Egypt, uh, you've talked about popularity and unpopular uh, regimes. Now, one can say that the Gamal Abdel Nasser's regime uh, in the 1950s was very popular. It was a popular uh, leader, of course. Uh, um, he could have made some reforms and he did uh, uh, um, uh, take control over uh, the feminist discourse. Hod uh, Shalawi and, and other uh, uh, feminist, well, famous feminists from the 1920s, uh, but of course it was a, a nation, national project, and not uh, something for women. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm talking so much, but um, yes, I'd like to take some others. Yeah. Okay, can you finish up? Uh, yeah, I'm finishing. Um, you've talked about the, the, the changes in marital age. Now, um, as far as I know, people don't get married not just because, uh, 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 not just as a matter of. Uh, uh, I'm more educated, thus I, I can I can do uh, uh, stuff with myself. But because of the economic uh, bad situation, and it, it has to be stressed, uh, and that's it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. As an outsider, just a listener, I just, at first want to uh, thank you all, the organizers and the speakers, for a insightful conference. Um, I'd like to share with you two um, thoughts that I had during those uh, three days or two and a half, and maybe to, uh, to hear your reaction to it. The first, and I've discussed it shortly with Professor Brody and Professor Herzog yesterday, is the almost total lack of any theological discussion during the conference. I do agree that religion is maybe mainly a system of control, but it's not only a system of control. And if postmodernism teaches us something, it teaches us that we are all believers in mm -hmm. some way or another. And I think that uh, to discuss religious without uh, discussion, discussing faith, without discussing, discussing uh, belief, our inner belief, and without asking ourselves how this can maybe um, empower us as women and as and human, woman beings, um, is um, show maybe something about our beliefs. Hmm. And uh, maybe it's, missing opportunity not just to point the problems but also to search ways of solution within this or out of this system of control and I would like uh, your comment on, on this. And um, the other thing that may connect with it and may connect with uh, things that Professor Orr said is that uh, my personal feeling as um, a secular is that in too many cases the critic about religious is used to uh, some 
somehow to clean the secular society, as if we, as secular, solved all our problems with patriarchy, and now we can look from the outside to those miserable women or miserable men who is chained in this uh, uh, terrible system, uh, and in a way look away from the patriarchal uh, system which work, uh, system of control which work in the secular and in the academia as well as everywhere else. And uh, maybe this division for itself is, um, should be um, rethink, rethinking as a feminist action. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, two, two points, uh, mainly for Tamar and uh, Pnina. Um, first of all, Tamar, I, I personally thank you for uh, the point you made about the positionality. It uh, was very um, strong for, uh, I guess, for some of us. Um, I'd just like to uh, mention perhaps um, two other insights which might be a little more obvious, um, and maybe that's why you um, uh, did not uh, touch upon them, uh, but I, I think it's important to mention them. Um, they're probably nothing new, but still, uh, for, at least for me, they were so apparent. Um, the, I, I don't know how this saying goes in, in English. I'm sure there is one. Satna de al akhadhu, the similarity and almost the identity uh, of the battles and the, the obstacles and the dynamics that uh, each of us, in, at least the religions that, we, that were discussed in this conference, mm -hmm. each of us share. Um, it just, every time I talk to, uh, I participate in such an interdenominational uh, dialogue, um, it strikes me as so strong. Um, so that's, that's something. And um, uh, part of it, I think, is another thing that was apparent, um, I think, in, in many of the papers presented here, is, is the backlash, that uh, we are at a turning point. We are at, uh, uh, we, 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 we all face a kind of backlash to some extent or, or another. Um, um, as, as for, for Pnina, the, the questions that you ended with, um, I uh, sympathize with them greatly, um, probably because we also share the same discipline, the same academic discipline, but the, it, 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 is, it is probably the, the, the million dollar question, what is the role of the state and what should we adapt, adopt as a tactic within the role of the state? And I think uh, there's, of course, no time to go into it, but the Israel experience and some other cases that were not discussed here, such as the uh, mixed sitting or the separate sitting in those uh, ultra-Orthodox buses run by the state or subsidized by the state, and the, um, the, the reactionary stand that the High Court of Justice took there and rejecting, denying the women's uh, petition, um, it's just another example that uh, we cannot really rely on the state. Perhaps we should also make some differentiation between what organ of the state we're talking about. Is it ju the judiciary or the just legislature? There are some differences. They're all um, men. Uh, excuse me? Oh, they're all men, oh, they're all men? yes, definitely. definitely. Um, Most of is anything, Does anything change when there are yeah. women there, right? Yes. Um, Age-old questions. Um, I, I, think, I think that... Um, um, the, the state is not is really not, not, not an answer, at least not the whole answer, and the, the internal uh, battles, uh, we should still be hopeful and um, try to be optimistic as to their uh, potential. Responses from up here? Maybe first we'll hear uh, Maina? Maina. Maina. Yeah. Yeah. Um, excellent uh, summation of things by uh, Tamara, thank you very much. I have a question for, uh, really, uh, uh, I was curious about uh, some things that were said by Nairi. Um, also <coughs> taking off from the questions raised by the young man there about um, how, if we're going to blame lack of democracy, uh, family law, which is resistant, levels of development, patriarchy for the way things are for Muslim women. Um, I come from a part of the world where we do have many of these things as well. Um, it may not be included in all the discussions that go on in this part of the world, but we do actually have that. And you did speak about women who are, um, 
who are at the receiving end of all this, but they were constructed, at least to me, listening from this side, as passive as uh, victims who, um, uh, who did not seem to have agency. You mentioned very briefly about women who are, to whom religion appeals. I think when you spoke about the uh, categorization of identity and you said that you know for, for markers of identity they, they do um, feel religion is attractive for them. But there are a lot of women today who have seen among students at the university in parts of India, uh, women who are actually going back to the veil or at least the kind of veil that we have which is not very strict in, in South Asia for Muslims. Uh, their mothers didn't necessarily use the veil. Uh, these are women, I'm, I'm saying, who, who actually do say that they believe in that, so they want to wear it now. And uh, we, we do want to give credit to that agency. Are we going to say that they don't look like victims, they don't sound like victims, right? And uh, they're not necessarily so highly politicized. So, I mean, where are we going to place that appeal of women who actually do want to support that, that they don't want to blame anything, they don't want to blame patriarchy, they want to talk about choice. So, you know, help me to understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to respond? Or? Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Uh, let me start with uh, Nina. With, I think perhaps you missed my part of talk that I actually addressed that, the identity politics and how women themselves are choosing the way. Uh, not restrictive way, not in the same sense that traditionalists have been using the way. Actually, these women are reinventing in a very reappropriating the way. And by doing that, and especially this was the, the, the second trend I was talking about, or second way of response that is common among the women of the uh, of uh, either... Uh, the recently urbanized women. Yeah, recently urbanized and or recent or especially among the immigrant diaspora communities or among minority Muslim, my, women who are minority within a majority non-Muslim context for whom identity becomes an issue. And they, and not only identity, but also they are sometimes coming from traditional families, but sometimes it, it, it's not pressure of family. It's pre it, the whole political pressure for the for for a search for authenticity, the, for search for an asserting an identity distinct from the, this globalized homogenization. So they are doing this very deliberately and consciously. Of course, I used. I mean, I'm showing their agency. I, I'm perhaps the last person to to consider women. Uh, as victim, I have been fighting against that perception. And um, so they're doing simultaneously at least three things by this new identity that they are constructing for themselves. At one, at, they're kind of, as I said, uh, constructing a new socially active, professional uh, womanhood, and so, which is distinct from this globalized hegemony. And also some of them, some of them who are coming from traditional religious family backgrounds, who, whose parents are very anxious and worried about them losing, you know, uh, to the Western decadent culture and so forth, especially among the diaspora community, they're kind of calming down the anxiety. It's, it's, this kind of way is more out of fear of men than for women. They're kind of calling down the anxiety and sense of insecurity of their brothers, fathers, husbands, saying that, no, I'm okay. I'm a virtuous uh, woman. I'm not going to become, you know, this sport, westernized decadent. I'm still a Muslim. I can, but, but I want to have education. I want to go out. I want to have a profession and so forth. And also, at this, you know, it's like a negotiation with modernity that they want to remain loyal to their community, but at the same time uh, go beyond the tradition and move on. Going back to uh, some of the comments you made, uh, Shumalik? Shumalik. Uh, Shumalik. Okay. Um, yes, of course, the modernists, uh, the reformers, uh, the Muslim reformers of early 20th century 
uh, we're not doing this out of uh, love for women, as you put it. Many of them were doing this from a developmental perspective, that it is a prerequisite to, to progress the society. And this is not different at all from Enlightenment philosophers, okay? Again, don't, don't make something essential about Muslim reformers. So it, it is the same thing. They were, think of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. What did he say? He was a revolutionary reformer, right? One of the most radical reformers uh, of the Enlightenment uh, era. But what was his attitude toward women and women's education? So it's not, we, we, we don't have any illusion about these reformers. It, they are only recently, especially even today in Iran, Muslim feminists have to fight, have to take them at stake, have to confront them all the time, the reformers to address. For example, Abdul Karim Surush, who's one of the internationally respected reformers within Islam, has not addressed the woman question still in an egalitarian manner. While some other Muslim reformers have done, but Surush specifically has been criticized by feminists, both secular feminists and Muslim feminists, for not addressing the sexuality issues, not addressing the gender issues. So there, there is this continuous uh, you know, struggle with that. About Ataturk and, uh, of course, Ataturk uh, used the Western model, the European model, and uh, Swiss model, but actually, in a way, he get more, he got, he moved a little more progressively by uh, granting women the right to vote, while it didn't happen in Switzerland. But not that the Ataturk's project had not its own shortcomings. Ataturk was very, you know, <coughs> was doing this from a uh, very state-centered uh, uh, manner. Yet, since Ataturk was popular, his project was more successful, relatively speaking, even though we had also backlash in Turkey, but uh, it was more successful compared to uh, someone like Reza Shah, who was not popular at all. Or consider Bourguiba in Tunisia. Tunisia is one of the most progressive uh, Muslim countries when it comes to the family law and women's. Uh, and the reason was why Bourguiba was successful in reforming and mobilizing people behind himself was he was considered a popular nationalist, you know, elected and uh, liked by people. Uh, yes, you are right that uh, increasing marriage age is in part due to economic hardship and the uh, cost of marriage, which is ridiculously remained very traditional, uh, very, it's uh, like five, four or five uh, times over the GNP of average Egyptian, the cost of marriage. So you can see what, a, what an obstacle it is. But that's the tradition which has remained and lagging behind the realities. But also, it is the change of attitudes among the young people. They, they consider compatibility and love now, and they want to choose their own partner. So it's both. Um, I guess I answered all the questions. I hope. We have um, nine minutes, so I'd like to take some very... Um, Can I uh, relate to... One thing that has a question over there. Yeah, well, let, let's give Tamara a chance, and then I'll take some very brief questions. Yeah. I just want to relate to one point uh, about theology, which is a serious point. Of, of, um, I think, it, uh, first of all, I think that you were right. There were there were very maybe two or three papers that had more towards tended more towards theological part. Uh, it was an historical sociological. Um, conference, more, more political, you know, historical and sociological, I would say that was the major, major political science tendency. When we shift now for a minute to the Israeli scenario of studying academic studies in this respect from these disciplines, um, I can say that the major harvest of research in feminism and feminism and um, religion is void of theological research, uh, and only now it starts to evolve from the orthodox feminist women who are going back to what was mentioned here as text-oriented, going back to reappropriate the text, and some non-orthodox men and women who are now starting to use feminist theory, studying the Talmud more and the text more, 
but not yet much of theology or thought. So it's a lacuna here, I, I admit. <coughs> Maybe it, it's something that has to do with academia, academia and theology in Israel, which unlike the situation in the Anglo-Saxon states where it's so strongly combined or, or Scandinavian, Western mm -hmm. European, in here it was, you know, there were, it was sort of really separated. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jose? Um, just to comment, uh, we met a narrative of progress in the uh, negotiation with modernity and how we cannot get away from somehow still keeping to it. Yes. And the uh, kind of nostalgia or actually uh, uh, attraction of these similar pictures in Istanbul and in Shanghai and in, you put basically in the 30s. Yes. Uh, uh, Shanghai, Istanbul, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Madrid. And, and so on, maybe look uh, very much alike. And of course, today uh, uh, we're much more open to a discourse of multiple modernities. I think precisely part of the problem of the backlash comes from the ultimately it was a project of one single cosmopolitan homogeneous modernity that ultimately really did not give uh, the possibility of all kinds of projects to somehow shape their own modernities. Not so much the position with one modernity. Here is where I also have some. Uh, uh, um, concerns with this notion of these models of trends between Islam. I think it's much more complicated we can have anymore, even trying to classify traditionalist Islam, radicalist Islam, and these other. It's a much more complex, and those things are so complicated. But, but this is an opening to the possibilities of all kinds of different modernities, where people can be different. Religions can maintain certain, their own traditions, while being modern religions in the same way, while, I mean, at the same time. So I think it's, it's more complicated, uh, uh, and it is the whole issue about uh, uh, empowering, uh, uh, and even within Israel religions, accepting that people can be Jewish in different ways, and can be Muslims in different ways, and uh, so it's, it's As long as they don't impose their ways on them. Yes, exactly, yeah. That's in the issue of tolerance, it's, it's, it's a very, very important, yeah. Right there. Um, I found your uh, example of the um, praying at the wall very, very interesting. I just wonder that you did present in a more ambivalent way, um, as it's not only the wall, it's not only um, a symbol for sovereignty, it's also a symbol for uh, 67. And so it, it makes the, the situation actually more interesting from a feminist point of view. Um, but I would like to suggest um, instead of the criteria for the public fight for religious rights, the criteria fighting for public places where it makes the most where it causes the, the most trouble, I would um, suggest maybe um, as a criteria, which and this relates also to the um, to the topic of generosity, as a criteria to um, engage in such feminist acts and, and activities that can encourage also women of other groups, of other religious groups, or of other ethnic uh, or national groups. But, but to, to have in mind the hierarchy of, of, um, of rights claims, where at the, point, at the example of the wall, this is so ambivalent. So you might find yourself in a mixed co coalition and you might find yourself in the in, in side of the coalition that you actually didn't, um, didn't want to be. <laughs> Yeah, that could be. Yeah, you want me to respond yeah, or you want to? Well, let's yeah, take. Uh, uh, take more questions? We can't. We. Uh, I don't know if we can. Let's get yeah. these two. Right here. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and also an answer to your uh, to, uh, to to what you had mentioned. Uh, there has been uh, lately a uh, ruling of the Supreme Court yeah. that the uh, area of the uh, Robinson's Arch, which is south of the women's section of the wall, can be developed as a plaza where everyone can meet and among others women can women women can pray and you had mentioned something about about uh, uh tova hartman so for those of you who may be here um uh beginning of next week her father has a very interesting institute david hartman institute and which uh, there are scholars from all religions who study there sometimes throughout the year but they have an open uh, meeting every uh, every two weeks. It'll be next Monday, which is devoted to women's rights and new interpretations of how women can be participate 
in the full range of Jewish uh, religious activities. So it's the David Hartman uh, Institute at eight, at eight o'clock. And uh, if I may say something to... Um, maybe we'll hear uh, more to, to, to not, Yeah, maybe uh, yeah. Let, me, let me go on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My question is uh, to Professor Lab and to Professor Ridley to refer to two uh, points which uh, I want to let the uh, uh, speak for it. Uh, the first one is uh, concerning uh, Colonel Gaddafi of uh, Libya, uh, the Green Book, if there is any article concerning women liberation and if it is uh, connected to this uh, women uh, uh, security, uh, presidential security guard, which he has. The second point concerning uh, the Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic Iranian uh, women guard who are uh, trained, I saw, in, I saw them in the television, they are trained with belt with rifle and at the same time they are using well how they can it's, an, it's a new weapon it's being developed it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. okay, okay. It, uh, 30 seconds for yeah. Evelyn um, unfortunately I couldn't be here for all the two days I just want to pick up on one point and that is the point of the prayer I think if we look at prayer we can really see the religious side and the secular side and the interesting thing is if you, if you cut down patriarchy, to it's very, very bare bottom. And I think we should stop beating this death horse and say, where do we go from here in a certain self? Basically, patriarchy settles the question for every human being in the world how to serve God. And that is why, and this would never occur to me, to tell another person what his relationship or her relationship with God should be. And in the Bible, therefore, between man and God stands the woman. And in Jewish tradition, it turns exactly around between woman and man stands, uh, stands uh, between woman and God stands man. That is why, this is the last sentence, that is why I think we have the idea of sovereignty. This idea of sovereignty pertains to religious thought and it pertains to enlightenment thought. And unless we realize that every human being is sovereign and the free monotheistic religions say that, the sovereignty of the human being, being and in God's image, etc., we, 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 we don't understand what it's all about. And I think we should discern ourselves, our rights. And that's the reason why at the age of 65, I was ordained as a rabbi. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, 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 we are out of time. Um, this has been a wonderful audience, a wonderful group of um, presenters. I do want to say we've had a lot of questions about should we be optimistic or pessimistic. Yeah. One thing I think we can all take optimism from is I, I don't know another conference like this that has occurred before or that could have occurred um, 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. If you look at the people in this room, um, there are some, some changes that really have taken place and that we are continuing uh, as a group. Hannah and I would like to continue that for uh, just a couple of minutes with our conference presenters, if we can have you all um, come up to the first the first circle here, but we like to thank the audience and uh, everyone who has participated. <laughs>